when you uh, blow into a glass bottle, the almost imperceptible sound of your breath uh, gets concentrated into a frequency proportional to the amount of water that's in here. And if you change the length, you change the pitch. Now that's how most antennas work, but not this one here. If you're trying to transmit uh, Wi-Fi, that's around two, three gigahertz, an antenna needs to be about this big. FM radio, 100 megahertz, order of magnitude larger. Trying to transmit AM radio, that's around a little under a megahertz, order of magnitude larger again. The antenna that I'm standing in front of here at the northwest cape of uh, up, halfway up the coast of Western Australia is transmitting at 19.8 kilohertz. That is very low frequency. This is a big antenna. Uh, it's big in size, but I'm only getting a little bit of it in shot right now. It's over a space that's over multiple square kilometers. There's 13 masts. It's tall, uh, it's a couple hundred feet tall, uh, but not tall enough to match the wavelength of 19.8 kilohertz signals. And it's powerful. It consumes about three megawatts of power. In terms of its radiated energy, uh, it's a military site. There's not a lot of publications around that. Somewhere in the order of one to two megahertz. What I can tell you is looking at my little recorder here, I'm getting a lot of um, very high frequency noise. Uh, you won't be able to hear it because uh, it's at 19.8 kilohertz, but it's just being picked up by the electronics in this device. I came out here with my camera and this magnetic loop to take some recordings. Turns out I didn't really even need this, but uh, this device is getting it just by itself. So today I want to talk a little bit about what this antenna does, how it works, and when I'm back at the lab, I'll go into decoding or at least demodulating uh, some of the signals that I got from that magnetic loop recorder. So as I said, this is a transmitter, one to two megahertz, sorry, one to two megawatts in the 19.8 kilohertz range. Why do you want to transmit um, at 19.8 kilohertz? Well, this site was built in the 1960s by the US government, US Navy to communicate with submarines. As the name may suggest, submarines are underwater. Um, water is a very good absorber of electric fields. And so traditional radio communications at more normal frequencies don't penetrate very far under the water surface. This antenna here is able to penetrate 40 meters or so down into you know, below the water surface. Now submarines are typically traveling you know, lower than that, but they can float up antennas to pick up this signal. You don't need an antenna this big to, to receive it, but obviously length helps. Um, so this is a submarine uh, communication station built in the 60s, taken over by the Australian government, I think in the 90s, uh, now given the number of Raytheon trucks driving around town here in Exmouth, operated day to day by Raytheon. How does it work? Well, a typical antenna, you want to have at least one quarter wavelength to resonate, to get that principle of blowing on a glass bottle. Why is a quarter wavelength the minimum wavelength for a you know, good transmitter? Well, if you imagine a sine wave, it starts off at zero, and rises up to one in a quarter wavelength, then the next quarter it goes back down to zero, then to minus one, then back up to zero. When you send a signal along a wire and it hits the end of that wire, it's going to reflect back. So you've got the length of that wire matching the at least one quarter wavelength of the frequency of the, the AC signal you're sending up. It'll go up, it'll hit the top of the wire, and then reflect back, effectively amplifying the current that's already in the wire, making a very good, um, efficient emitter of that signal. Now the wavelength of this antenna is in the order of you know, 15 or so kilometers. Uh, the antenna at a quarter wavelength would have to be multiple, multiple kilometers high. That's an impressive guy, but it's not multiple kilometers high. The way they make this electrically short antenna effectively, somewhat effectively radiate um, at 19.8 kilohertz is by using a very, very large capacitor. The reason why this site is so big is we are standing next to probably one of the world's largest capacitors, at least in terms of area. A capacitor, as you'll recall, maybe, is two plates, two electrically conductive plates separated by a di dielectric. And what a capacitor does is it stores charge. Charge builds up on those plates, energy gets stored in the electrical field between those two plates, and it takes time to charge up that capacitor. So where's the capacitor here? Up at the central mast, their uh, radiating wires that come out to the 13 masts around it, the 12 masts. That makes the top plate of the capacitor. The bottom plate of the capacitor is buried underground, about 30 centimeters, I think, underground. There's hundreds of kilometers of copper wire. 
and so you have top plate and the bottom plate of a very large capacitor. So the 19.8 kilohertz feed signal comes in, goes up the radiating elements. There's four panels around the central mast, each containing, I think, six conductors. It hits the top of that uh, panel um, before the full wavelength. But because of the capacitor, there's time there for that charge to continue, that current to continue to flow, and it charges up the capacitor between the top and the bottom. So you've electrically, electrically lengthened the effective length of that piece of wire by having the capacitor. Now, you've also changed the reactance characteristics of the antenna, so they need to begin inductor somewhere off in that facility that sort of uh, balances everything out. You effectively have a very highly tuned circuit that's tuned to resonant at 19.8 kilohertz. Uh, that presents some interesting challenges in how you actually use this to transmit. Um, if you want to do something like uh, FM, frequency modulation, you want to have a carrier frequency and you want to modulate it back and forth. Because this thing is so highly tuned, you know, even 50 hertz, I think, of uh, deviation sets off the tuning uh, of this resonant circuit. Um, so when I get back to the lab, I'll show you the recordings coming from my field recorder and my magnetic loop. And we'll have a look at how this thing is encoded. Obviously, we're not going to be able to decrypt any of this stuff. It'll hopefully be highly encrypted. Um, but it'll be an interesting look at the world of RF signaling and VLF, very low frequency communication. Thanks for sticking around.